a malfeasance. Anything can happen. How's Gene? Who's Gene? Ah! My wife. Oops. <laughs> All due respect, Jerry, I don't want you mucking this up. The heck do you... Okay, it's fucking... Uh, this, uh, hello, welcome back to the retrospect, Waffle Press retrospective, Failed War Contender Season Three, Fargo. Um, I just got to complain really quick. Whoever <laughs> has uh, Apple products and they use GarageBand to record the anything, if you have your phone near you and you have your Bluetooth on, does it always try to use your phone as an uh, as a microphone, not even a backup, as a primary microphone? Every time I use GarageBand now, I have to shut it off immediately. There's some smart Otherwise features. Otherwise, it doesn't use my microphone. Yeah, I have to turn. Yeah, I have to turn Bluetooth off on like a ton of my shit if I'm doing like basic things. So much smart technology just sucks, you know. Like, yeah, I know. The one, I know. The one that really annoys me is like, you know, if you have like headphones in, and like you have, I have these wireless headphones, and someone will get, a, I'll th- get a phone call, but I want to talk on speaker, and I'll hit speaker, and it will go to speaker, but then like, twenty seconds later, I'll be like, oh hey, let's switch back to your headphones for no reason. And it's just like ugh, it, that can be really fr- it, it's it doesn't make any sense. And then there's just yeah like, no the most my most boomer opinion is like I don't know what's wrong with this this wired headphones and wired everything. Yeah, it's I, like I fuck. There is some can I, I was weird. I had a moment where like I finally bought wireless earbuds right. And I had a moment where I was like, yeah, you know what? These are actually better. Like yeah, I get it. And then like. I started having problems with them and I had to switch back to wired. And now I'm like, I'm totally fine with wired. Everyone can go fuck themselves. Like, I don't know what, not, yeah. not everything needs to be wireless. Um, and now, now it's just like, I've been trying to get like, it's so, it's becoming so much more challenging to get older stuff to work on newer TVs because of like all the dumb smart features and the signals and shit like that, that it's driving me a little nuts. But yeah, what I will say is I could use some convincing about wireless headphones, <laughs> sponsorships, potentials. Um, but I, uh, I also agree like the like Are the you... extent you have to to go to to connect like older things. Like I can't just plug in my my old uh, Canon camcorder I got like way back in the day. Yeah. That my parents got me like I have to plug it into one thing to connect to another thing, something else that will allow the plug-in to be understood by a modern computer <laughs> and then an extra adapter after that. Then like, I'm halfway there. I have two of those adapters. I and need then the you last have to, two. to download some like program that was made by someone in his garage because the original program is no longer supported by the company that made it. Like, yeah, it's, 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 I've had to do it with like tons of live in, in hell, like flash now. Like you can't use flash anymore. So you have to use like, a, like a completely independently developed version of Flash to like run things, mm-hmm. and it's it's so it's so fucking ridiculous. Um, uh, yeah, uh, that's get, my co-host, Mac Rico. Yes, that's me. Everyone knows who the fuck I am. Um, I know. <laughs> and when I was uh, uh, Gene and I did um, our our biweekly hangouts with a uh, uh, guest, uh, uh, Lexi from Schooled by Cinema podcast, and as we were like ending the show it's like you know we, we hype up our guests uh, here's where you can listen to them and their their excellent podcast um and then when it when it gets to gene and i'm like you know like if you're if you're watching this you're yeah. like you know gene and i already you follow us that's why you're here so you don't know, worry about it we have a dedicated listenership and that's it <laughs> yeah <laughs> every once in a while we, we break beyond that yeah who fucking knows why um because okay, people, nobody talked about the last Boy Scout until we talked about. I it guess, again. I guess you're right. Now it, it seems like it is back, though. Like it seems like it's starting to come back. As like everyone I likes know, that movie. I know it's, it's great. Uh, shout out TJ Mackey on mm. Twitter. Uh, excellent Tony Scott proponent. God, constantly I, sharing last Boy Scout clips like I am. So I hope our thank Babylon you. episode doesn't go anywhere because that's not an because the audience that might find that episode is not the audience I want listening to the show. Based based no, on uh, some people... of the tangents we went on, <laughs> or I no, went. You on. know what? I'm very curious about that too because um, people were saying like, "Oh, Margot Robbie wasn't snubbed for Barbie. She was really snubbed for Babylon." <laughs> and they're doing that scene where she's Sorry. on the uh, she's like laugh. with the food scene. You know? Yeah. You know when yelling yeah, yelling and... is acting. Yeah, yeah. Uh, acting is when you yell in one location and then the camera sits still. 
while you move back and forth and, and act exacerbated. Mm. And this is nothing against her, and I think we've made that clear in that yeah. episode. We were both big well, Margot Robbie I, yeah, fans. Yeah, I'm also a proponent um, of, I think she sh- she deserved an Oscar nomination more than Ryan Gosling did, is all I'll say. But Whoa. Yeah, I, that's I my... think they both deserved it equally. No, she deserved it more. The movie doesn't work without her. It could have worked without him. I agree with that as well. He's he's just um, Ken. Hey. <laughs> we brought uh, back... Uh-oh. No, I, I said it before, and I think I even said it on the Babylon episode, but he gets the flashy performance, yeah. like, externally. That's easier for people to, like, latch onto. She does it all internally. Yeah. You know? So it's, it's I don't know, it's just different types of acting. They're both excellent in that movie. Everyone's super fucking weird about a really strong B-plus movie. Yeah, yeah, like a fastball down Sometimes the stuff's just entertaining mm-hmm. people. Yeah, and then people are like... This is a war crime, or I will kill anyone that criticizes this movie. Like, those seems to be the two speeds with Barbie at this point. Um, yeah, like, Jesus Christ. Shout out to everything, everyone no one has, at once, as well. <laughs> no one has feelings like that about any Coen Brothers movie, though, which I find fascinating. Um, You know what, though? I wonder, I think it's just because there aren't, pe- there, there are no, like, real critics of the Coen Brothers in that respect. You know what I'm saying? Like, there aren't people out there being like, the Big Lebowski is, like, a war crime. You know what I'm saying? Like, I know mm-hmm. people who think The Big Lebowski is a little overrated, but... I, it, William it's... Goldman, R.I.P. King. Oh, you know he, about this? He didn't like The Big Lebowski? Well, he thought it was, like, fine, but he was like, well, if you set up the bowling stuff, you have to... The resolution and the climax have to involve the bowling stuff. Otherwise, oh. why, is, why is it in the picture? Oh, Will. Oh. And oh. that that's just screenwriter brain, you know? Yeah, I, I get it. But, like, that's part of what makes that movie great. Like, Yeah, I agree. The I dude, agree. The dude never even bowls. <laughs> like, <laughs> um, but, yeah, but yeah. like, I, you know, I don't think there are people being like, the the Coen brothers are indicative of something wrong with society, which seems to be the take on some of the negative takes on Barbie. You know what I'm saying? Oh um, yeah. Like, of, uh, you know, like that. Yeah. Cause you know, it is a, yeah, like, that, like, that's a, it's a very capitalist like, film, Barbie. Like I get it, but yeah. like, you know. sorry, it didn't like, like solve feminism, I guess. Well, like, well no, like, look, I get it. Cause it, it is one of those things where like, it takes some like very serious stuff and like, waters it down and repackages it and sells it back to you. You know what I'm saying? Like, I get it. Yeah, yeah. I get where some of the people, sometimes I'm just like, this, put this energy somewhere else. I feel like I could say that about a lot of things on the internet, but it would also be very hypocritical of me since we do a podcast where we complain about movies. <laughs> so <laughs> I can't complain about where anyone puts their energy. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Um, where do we put our energy in regards to Fargo and our history with the Coen brothers? There hey. we go. That's a segue. Did we even say we're here to talk about Fargo? Yeah, yeah. I said it right before I started ranting. Oh, okay. All right. I, I, I missed it. So just in case our audience... Oh, it was have, really fast. Our audience might have also missed it. We're here to talk about Fargo, the 1996 Coen brothers film, which... Uh, Kind of violating some of our failed award contender rules because it did win Best Actress and it won Original Screenplay. Shh, um, they didn't know that. It's fine. You didn't know that? No, no, they didn't even know that. Well, they're they can they they can Google. <laughs> yeah, but but maybe they won't. In, uh, Look, like now they're gonna. You picked Fargo. I forgot you picked Fargo and then didn't question it. So we're, now we're here. <laughs> it beat Shawshank Redemption. People are going to have some questions. Are they, though? Because, like, look, I think Shawshank is one of those movies like The Godfather that a lot of people, not everyone, but a lot of people just kind of, like, consider one of the best movies But there's ever. a... And there I is, love Shawshank. There's a strong not my... anti-Shawshank Redemption crowd out there, though. There is, yeah. It's, it's not one of my favorites. You know, it is a great movie, but uh, it's not on on my like top hundred list or something like that. Mm-hmm. It's not. I'm. It's not my number one, like IMDb or whatever. Okay, I mean, yeah, I would agree, but it is also one of those movies. Part of the reason why I wanted to talk about it is that it is one of those movies where you go, yeah, it's not in my top like one hundred, but also anytime it's on, I watch it. You know what I'm saying? Like, yeah, uh, yeah. I gotta stop saying you know what I'm saying. I say it way too fucking much. But, uh, but what if I don't know what you're saying? That can't happen. It's fine. I know. Don't worry about it. I can't. I, I I am terrified of people being confused by what I'm saying. 
My parents divorced when they were very young. I am terrified of people misunderstanding what I'm saying. It's something I will never get over as a human being. I'm going to die broken. Anyway, Fargo. Um, Jesus Christ. <laughs> well, I, all right. I, I wanted to bring up the awards thing because this feels like a real turning point for the Coen brothers where they they are suddenly validated, right? Like 100%. They they have been building up to this point, but they they up until this point in the in in general consensus, they have been kind of like mystifying people and confusing them, right? Like mm-hmm. So you have like Blood Simple, which is one of the early Sundance movies. That one is gen- generally like well liked by everyone, right? Um, yeah, it, it comes out. Uh, Raising Arizona, their follow up, like totally divides critics. People don't remember this, right? Like a lot of these movies about the list are considered like classics now, and they were not in their time. <laughs> Roger Ebert gave Raising Arizona one and a half stars. Um, That's so fucking crazy i know like raising arizona is, you could make the argument that raising arizona is the funniest movie ever made right like you like i'm not saying that's my argument but i people could make that argument that that's the best comedy ever made right like people yeah. love that movie um miller's crossing another one that um i know that siskel and eber both gave miller's crossing a negative review um it also bombed uh, and that was a lot of people, a big take on that was like, it's all style, no substance, which is like, it's crazy that, that used to be the take on the Coen brothers, right? That yeah. there are a lot of style, no substance. Barton Fink comes out and wins the Palme d'Or as well as best director and best actor, which is like one of like the rare times that has ever happened, right? Like, mm-hmm. and I think that's the one where critics kind of have to go like, okay, maybe we should take these guys a little more seriously. Um, their next movie is Hudsucker, which is like this huge bomb. No one likes it. And then Fargo comes out and people like almost immediately hail Fargo as an American classic, right? Like, uh, yeah. Cisco, to bring it back, to, just cause Cisco and Ebert are kind of a good barometer for like the, you know, what the general public thinks of movies. Um, in, in his review, Siskel, this, the movie came out in March. Siskel said that he didn't think he would see a better movie that year than Fargo. So that's that's a pretty bold statement to make that early, you know? Um and Yeah, that's yeah. uh I, I didn't know um about the super low rating for uh uh Raising Cro- Arizona. Like, Raising I'm still kinda shook by that. Yeah. Well I mean then and then to bring to bring it right back, Big Lebowski comes out next year and also baffles people, right? Like they go right back into it, you know? And mm-hmm. it really feels like I think we're lucky because we're both around the age where No Country for Old Men comes out. And when I see that in theaters, which I saw with my father and my grandfather, like way young in theaters, um, I am I have no context that that movie is a comeback film for the Coen brothers, essentially, right? Like, mm-hmm. they, they did... Intolerable Cruelty and Lady Killers back to back. They were basically contractually obligated to do the Lady Killers. Um, I, one of those was supposed to be directed by Ron Howard at some point, but then like Ron Howard dropped out. Um, and they almost they almost retire from filmmaking somewhere in there too. Uh, they were developing the movie. Um, I think it was. I think it's the book to the White Sea or to the White Shore. Do you know what I'm saying? Um, let me, see, let me see if I can look it up. I can't remember the... Uh, to the White Shore is... I, I'm getting... To the White Sea, um, which is a, a book set in, like, World War II about, like, a, a plane, a pilot who, like, crashes and has to, like, escape back to um, American lines. Uh, and they were, like... Okay, no, they, were no, develop- no, no, no. they were developing it. It was going to have Brad Pitt in it in, like, the early 2000s. It falls apart. Their mother, I think, also dies or like has a stroke somewhere in there, and they kind of were like, "We're going to retire from filmmaking," and they're like, "We're just going to write screenplays." That's where you get like, you know, like remember that Gambit movie that happened that they wrote but didn't direct that the remake of Gambit. Like, oh they, yeah, yeah, they wrote that at some point during this period. That's also like they do the the uncredited rewrites on like Bad Santa. Um, they, there's, there's, there's a few of this. They wrote, they, they essentially wrote Intolerable Cruelty and Lady Killers for other people and then ended up directing it. And then No Country for Old Men is kind of the thing that brings it back. And that starts that run of 
No Country, Burn After Reading, Serious Man, True Grit, Inside Lewin Davis. And I'll just stop at Hail Caesar just because that was like their last theatrical release, you know? Um, but oh like, my god, that's right. Yeah. Um, but that was like, the, it starts this incredible, essentially 10 year run for them, right? Of mm -hmm. just banger after banger. And then they're just, now they're like hailed as, a, as, as American like filmmakers. Like they're the, they're peak there. You, you can't, uh, you know, you can't, um, talk about American film without talking about the Coen brothers. Um, and then they break up, they do Ballad Buster Scruggs for Netflix. They break up, they each do one movie and Ethan does a documentary, which I've never seen. And uh, now they're going to, allegedly, they're getting back together again. Um, but also Suburbicon is in there somewhere. <laughs> oh, yeah. yeah. Um, which is like, apparently that was yeah. a script they had written in like the 90s that George Clooney bought. And then George Clooney added a bunch of shit to it. Um, that would be a disaster. Uh, we could talk about it, Suburbicon. It's not very good. It's, it's, um, it's almost very bad. I, I do want to mention that... Um... Ethan Cohen's uh, Drive Away Dolls like comes out like days after this recording. Oh, yeah, it's probably yeah. very good. So a Cohen hope people brother watch made, it. The, a Cohen brother made a good movie. I find that hard to believe. I I know I know I know. I mean, but look, but I guess I, I'm just I'm hoping people like show up for it. No one's gonna show up for it. it's gonna bomb. But <sighs> we've all given up, Diego. <laughs> Also, no offense, but film tour doesn't help things. You guys are the most defeatist motherfuckers on the planet. Um, oh yeah, no, you know I'm I'm really over the everyone being like God. Like it's funny to say like we used to make movies in this country and stuff like that. Like and not really mean it. Yeah. But some people really mean it, and they're like, Oh, we're never gonna see a movie like this ever again. We're yeah. never. Gonna, and it's like you you might. I don't know. Life's not over. Sure, the planet might be dead in fifty years, but like Jesus Christ. Yeah, Get it together, people. I'm always like that, that sort of thing. It only benefits the people that want everything to fall apart. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> like, it's yeah. Just, it's... Slap yourself upside the head. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Wake up. Yeah. Motherfuckers. Yeah, you uh, fucking idiots. But I, I, guess, I don't mean that one. I guess what I'm saying now that, like, when we look back at the Coen Brothers filmography now, I'm not saying I would agree, but you could make the argument that the Coen Brothers have never made a bad movie, right? Like, mm -hmm. you could make that argument. Now, I don't know about Lady Killers, <laughs> um, but uh, you could make... So I could see someone making the argument, and I wouldn't push back. And then, even then, Lady Killers, not a great movie, but it's also better than, like, a lot of other movies, you know? So, mm -hmm. uh, and it's just, it's interesting that Fargo is, like, this moment where it's, like, this seals them as being great filmmakers. Like, this is finally what, like, okay taken seriously and i also i wonder if that would even happen again today if like some people as divisive as the coen brothers up to this point would ever get a moment like this because it feels like because of the internet when battle lines are drawn they don't go away you know um yeah everything's like hyper focused immediately like now you have like someone i think we both enjoy to various degrees maybe less so for <laughs> you now like ari aster's three movies in right <laughs> um I think a lot of people who don't like him, they're committed to just not liking him yeah. now. Not everyone, but a lot of people who don't like him. Yeah. They're like, fuck this guy. Well, he's, he's a hack, whatever. Um, he thinks he's too good for horror. There's also that angle. Well, that's what I, talked I, about before. I have made that point. At, at various oh yeah, points. you know it's you. <laughs> that's, that's my that's my point actually. Although like I'm also like I'm not totally like being like fuck him for that. I'm just also like, yeah, go ahead, make other things, but try not to make always afraid again. <laughs> oh yeah, I thought it was pretty funny. Yeah, bad movie. Um, but it goes also, on a little long. Um, it's yeah, it goes on very long. You get the point like fucking twenty minutes in, and then there's three hours of that goddamn thing left. And I liked Nathan, it. And then Nathan Lane maybe has ten minutes of screen time. I know he he should have been Bo. He should have played every character. <laughs> yeah, someone should just do that. Someone should just make a movie with Nathan Lane where he's every role. Yeah, it would work. Yeah. <laughs> it seems like he's coming. He's trying to make a comeback as like a, a movie actor because he's done with like the stage. So we might be we might be mm -hmm. on the at the beginnings of a Nathan Lane renaissance. I hope so. He's one of my boys. Yeah, he's the best. Nothing would make me happier. 
Good, good, good for Nathan Lane. Um, and he's good in yeah. Bo is Oh, he could be in a Coen Brothers movie. He totally could. I'm surprised he hasn't been in one. Yeah. Um, although I don't know what the Coen... The Coen's... Their casting is always strange. Um, yeah, but it's always so good. It's just very strange. It's interesting that they, they split up and then they both do movies with, like, their most diverse casts ever. <laughs> yeah. It, that was a little strange, you know? Um, mm-hmm. I don't know what that means ultimately, but because uh, like the most diverse Coen Brothers movie before like Tragedy Macbeth is like the Lady Killers, and that's not good. <laughs> it's a it's a bad one to have some mm-hmm. diversity in. Um, yeah, <laughs> but uh, especially there, there's also a problem with how they make everyone seem like idiots, so that doesn't help things. But, Mm -hmm. um, all right. So talk about the Coen brothers. So, yes. So when did you get into the Coen brothers? I think no country around there because that movie took the world by storm a little bit. Um, then after that, my parents who are both divorced by this time, um, Mm -hmm. like a, a, like a decade on of divorce, basically, uh, separately because, um, because of like uh, no country was such a hit, everyone's talking about the Coen Brothers and stuff like that. And it's like, oh, I hear about raising Arizona that way. I hear about Fargo, uh, and everyone like loves raising Arizona and mm-hmm. loves Fargo. And so then eventually, I'm pretty sure I watch Raising Arizona first. I, mm-hmm. I'm pretty sure. Um, and then that blows me away, and that's that's still like one of my favorite movies. Mm-hmm. Um. And Fargo comes along, and I'll be honest, I I don't think I, I vibed with it right oh, away. Oh, all right. Where Raising okay. Arizona is like live action Looney Tune shit, so I'm just like, yay, you know. And Fargo is like so dry, like it, like I I love this movie now. Yeah. Um, th- this is totally still one of their, I think rightfully considered one of their best films. Um, but it's just so like deadpan and dry uh and like the the meanness of the idiotic characters is is really mean mm-hmm. um and i don't know i i think it, it just uh it rubbed me the wrong way when i was younger and i wasn't really open to receiving something like that you didn't uh, understand why even though it is ultimately like it ends on a very sweet note and stuff like that you know mm-hmm. we'll talk about the note um, this movie ends on Mm-hmm. Um, I, uh, with the Coen brothers, I can't tell you what exactly came first. A lot of this kind of blends together because, but there is a stretch where at some point it's like, I watch Fargo, No Country for Old Men, Big Lebowski, all fairly close to each other. Right. Um, mm-hmm. all in that similar to you in that like 2007 period. But I think. If I had to put a finger on it, I think Oh Brother Where Art That was my first. And I think that That's was, an interesting one. Well, I think it's because my friend Dan showed it to me, and Dan is Dan exposed me to some of the best movies I had ever seen in my life. And he wasn't like a film fan. He was just a kid whose like dad would be like, watch this movie, and he would watch it and love it. Dan showed me um The Elephant Man. Uh which was like my first David Lynch. Um, he showed me Oh Brother Art Thou, which was a big one. He brought it to a sleepover. <laughs> you want to get the type of character Dan was. And then uh, he showed me Doctor Strange Love. And he showed me uh, what was the other one? Oh, he showed me Sunset Boulevard. And then I borrowed That's his so crazy. I borrowed his DVD copy and never gave it back. <laughs> so I I feel bad about that to this day. I always I always remind myself next time I see him I gotta pay him back in some way. But uh, yeah I, I borrowed it. But also he borrowed my copy of the Beast of Yucca Flats and never gave it back. So who really Ooh. who really won in the end? Uh, <laughs> but I I think he showed he showed our brother Art Thou. Again, he was like at a sleepover. It was one of those, you know, like you go to sleepover friends. I don't know if you did this, but you would go to sleepover and everyone would bring a movie, and then there would be like a consensus on what to watch, right? And maybe you'd watch mm-hmm. two or something like that. 
and uh, I'd, I'd usually bring a horror film. <laughs> um, and I think what happened this time was that one of our friend's brothers was part of it, and that brother was like like the biggest scaredy cat on earth, so we couldn't watch any horror movies. <laughs> so no. it, it, it cut my, I think I brought the Blair Witch Project because they had been bugging me to watch it because they knew I had a copy. And uh, Dan brought a brother right down. We watched it, and I really enjoyed it. And it's kind of be, it, it remains something we talked about within that friend group forever. But I was also kind of vaguely aware of the Coen Brothers because I had I I think I brought this up on our last recording, or maybe we talked about it off mic. The uh, Bravo 100 scariest movie moments list. No, that was, was definitely on the on the show. I think. Yeah. Well, Blood Simple was was on that list. The scene where he gets stabbed through the hand. And that was, and it, it was, it's a lot of people being like, I like the Coen brothers. And I'd be like, those guys sound important. And then I also had heard about the whole uh, controversy surrounding this movie about it saying it's a true story at the beginning. Um, mm-hmm. And when it's not, right? Uh, that it's, yeah. it's, I knew that because like it was apparently, I think that ended up being a big deal when the Oscar campaign started. Um, but no one seems to care anymore. <laughs> so. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but that was probably so. Like I, I definitely. And the other thing, the other one in the middle of this is that before I watched the Big Lebowski, I think I've told this story on the podcast. My introduction to YouTube was my dad being like, "We gotta go to this website called YouTube." Someone edited the Big Lebowski, so it's just all the times they say "fuck." I don't know if people remember this. Used to be a thing on YouTube. There would be the fucking short version of movies. So yes, like, I do remember that. It, it was like it was like Big Lebowski and like Goodfellas. So just be t- anytime someone said "fuck." And that was like that was what YouTube used to be for, and my dad showed yeah. it to me, and then I went, "What's the Big Lebowski?" And he realized he had never seen it, so he showed <laughs> it to me. Um, and that was I, I only saw that one before Fargo. Uh, but I have another. I have one other run in with the movie Fargo before actually seeing it, which is for Christmas one year when I was a kid, my grandmother got my dad Fargo on VHS. Um, and it was like, you know, a gift cause she's like, oh, you like movies. <laughs> and so got my father Fargo. Someone made the decision to place the VHS tape, you know, underneath the desk we used for the family computer in the living room. And at some point I went and hopped on the computer and I didn't pay attention. And at some point I had stomped on the VHS tape and broke it. Oh so no. I, and and it's not, this isn't, I wasn't, I never got in trouble for him. And I was like, ah, oh, that's fine. Like he didn't really seem to care, but I was, but it always intrigued me. Cause I had, there was this, it was this, uh, VHS tape and it's like, it's like a cop lady in the snow and I accidentally broke the VHS tape. Uh, oh. And that stuck out my memory for a long time until I finally saw the movie. And then my dad also had the poster for the big Lebowski. And it was one of those, like, I had imagined what that movie must have been, like, since childhood, and it was couldn't be further from what that movie ended up being, you know? Yeah. <laughs> uh, so, but at some point, I think, I, I would have to say it's probably after No Country is when I'm like, I'm all in on the Coen brothers, and that's probably when I watched Fargo, and then slowly went through their whole filmography. Uh, the other story I have is just I, when I, uh, I bought Miller's Crossing and, and Lady Killers without having seen them from a DVD store that was going out of business, uh, like a mom and pop type store. And I was there with my grandfather oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. and I, and I went and I, I, I handed it to the lady and it had like a little sticker that said Coen brothers on it. They, they, it was one of those stores that organized them by their director, not alphabetically, which is always cool. Um, mm-hmm. and, uh, she went like, Oh, you like the Coen brothers? I'm like, yeah. And she's like, you can kind of skip the lady killers, <laughs> which I always, I always found funny that, this this woman, her business is shutting down, but she still tried to talk me out of buying the Lady Killers. <laughs> that it's like, that's how you know they're like a, a decent yeah person at least in, it, in terms of like that like selling you stuff. And it's it was like, one yeah, of those, maybe don't. It was one of those cool stores where like she was the daughter of like the guy who founded the place, you know, like. It was, oh it had, yeah, it had, that's cool. It had been in their family. It was a shame. It was the only time I ever went because they like because they were closing. So, I I didn't I never I, I would be I would be there every fucking week now if it was still open. But um, yeah, I went there and I got two Coen Brothers movies. So that had to have been in the year like two thousand eight then, because um, that was like my big Coen Brothers year. Um, but 
Yeah, so Fargo was definitely mixed in there somewhere, and I definitely—I I was the opposite of you. I was definitely like, this movie is amazing, like first time out, right? Like, it's like, I, where has this movie been my whole life? Type moments, which I was just having nothing but those moments back then as a, a young budding cinephile, you know. Mm-hmm. You know, it's like you watch you watch fucking Pulp Fiction. You're like, where has this been my whole life? You oh watch, yeah, uh, I but, I saw Reservoir Dogs yeah. first. Same, and I, I same got actually. it on iTunes, mm-hmm. yeah, and what? then um, I I got it like right before uh, a friend took me up with, the, with their family to spend like the New Year like Big Bear or something like that. Mm-hmm. Great, and bear. I was like, well, I need stuff to watch on the way there, and I was just like, holy shit, this movie. <laughs> Were you, like, in the car watching fucking Reservoir Dogs? Yeah, on my oh little my... iPod. Oh, my, my God. My iPod that's, video. That's a crazy way to watch that fucking movie. Yeah, and I was like, I don't think I can raise the volume any louder. <laughs> um, wow, that's an interesting way. That's like, yeah, it's like you watch Seven, you're like, where has this movie been? You watch, watch Goodfellas, you're like, where has this movie been? You watch The Boondock Saints, and you go, I hate this. But... Yeah. Um, <laughs> So we all have we all had that moment in our life. Listen, listen. Say what you will about the Boondock Saints. Hey, uh, yeah. That, <laughs> it does have a good documentary about the making of it, though. Does it? I don't recall. Oh, you've never seen Overnight? I don't think I have. No. Oh my god, it's a crazy documentary. It was basically like the fucking guy was so confident that the Boondock Saints was going to be this massive hit that he basically paid, like, friends to do a uh, uh, a documentary about the making of it, and it just portrays Troy Duffy, the guy who made Boondock Saints, in, like, the worst light humanly possible. Um, mm. And he comes across, like, with, like, a massive... It's basically one of those, like... Because the story, for people who don't know, is that, like, he was a bartender who sold his script to fucking Harvey Weinstein for $300,000. And it was like one of those like overnight Harvey Weinstein fucking like, you know, he's, he picked Tarantino out of obscurity. He picked Robert Rodriguez out of obscurity. He picked Kevin Smith out of obscurity. Like, it's like, he just picked this bartender. This guy is going to be the next director with the boondock saints. And so you watch him like, you know, overnight he became this guy. And then you watch him just like totally fall apart uh, during the making of the boondock saints. Which got a Ouch. sequel at some point, right? Like, oh uh, yeah, yeah. Like ten years later, All Saints Day. Um, never, never saw it. Um, I don't. I don't think anyone saw it actually. Uh, do people still like the Boondock Saints? I don't think so. At least I certainly hope not. I know. I know. I know a few uh, people I went to high school with who were really into Boondock Saints because uh, they thought Norman Reedus was hot. So, there's worse reasons to like a movie. Yeah, yeah, I guess. What's um, that what's There's that also better reasons to? to like movies. Yeah. No, if you're in high school, there are no better reasons. If, yeah. If, if it's got a hot right. person in it, then you like the movie. And frankly, the older I get, I'm starting to come back around to that opinion. Like, the movie <laughs> sucks, but there are hot people in it. It's okay to like. Yeah. Maybe I should watch the Marvels. <laughs> Never mind. <laughs> yeah, 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 that's what I, I thought. That's I withdraw. I, thought. I withdraw my point. <laughs> oh, I gotta give one of another chance. Oh no. <laughs> oh no, no. Yeah, but well, all right. Um, actually, let me amend my statement. There can be hot people in it, but they have to be hot in the thing. Okay. Yeah. Which yeah. just that just doesn't happen in any Marvel movies, except for Eternals for some reason. But yeah. Um, but hey, uh, I wouldn't say there's anyone hot in Fargo, though. No? Well, at least they're not portrayed hot, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, I'm like, Not, not to hurt anyone that's, you know, the big Buscemi stands out there. I love him, <laughs> I love him too, but he looks, he, he he's funny looking in this. And he also looks like a guy who would fail at a kidnapping, <laughs> which is exactly what he is. Um, yeah, um... When do you think you came around on this? Uh, God, probably... Honestly, maybe, like, uh, uh, right before Hail Caesar. 
Because oh, okay. I was like a big defender of Hail Caesar, like right out the gate. So yeah. I must have been on the wavelength around then already. Damn, that that's a while, like, honestly. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Like it wasn't even like a hate thing. I was just like, yeah, whatever. It's good. Yeah. Bye, I know people. Bye. I know people that always have that one Cohen they don't really vibe with. Like to bring up my friend Dan again. I know he doesn't like the Big Lebowski. Like he's a pretty big Cohen Brothers fan, but doesn't like the Big Lebowski, which I find interesting. <laughs> At the top of this, I. I was uh, sort of talking about how, like, oh, if the, if the Cohen brothers have, like, shooters, like, the way we're talking about, like, the Barbie stands or haters yeah. have it, you know? Um, I do think the, the, the audience for Big Lebowski did get really annoying at a certain point. Mm. And then I rewatched it, and it was like, fuck, that's such a good fucking yeah. movie. Well, <laughs> like, it those, doesn't matter. It's one of those where you're, like, d- like, quoting the Big Lebowski these days is basically cringe, right? Like, it's... Yeah. It's just, that's where we're at as a culture. But you watch the Big Lebowski, and you understand why people quote it, and why it's it's stuck around. Like, it's it, it is kind of... It, it's one of those where, like, I think it's cringe to put the Big Lebowski as your favorite Coen Brothers movie, but also, like, you could make the argument, you know, like, it's, mm-hmm. it is, a, it's a genuinely great movie. It's just, it, it, yeah, it has that weird, like, Lebowski, it's where, the, like, the Coen Brothers sparked, essentially, like, what other, like, what other, like, fandoms have, have cons dedicated specifically to the fandom, right, to that thing? I mean, uh, Nolan for a bit, honestly. I think the, it's honestly died down now. No, but, like, is but... there... But are there, like, conventions for Nolan? Oh, oh, um... No, no, yeah, I can't think of anyone. Because there is Lebowski Fest, and then, uh... Let's see, I, I think Lebowski Fest is kind of like a semi-irregular thing. And they're, they're probably... I think all cons are basically dead at this point because of, uh, COVID. So, mm-hmm. um... But the other one, I think, uh, the only one off the top of my head I can think of is, like, My Little Pony, you know? Like, so, it's... Oh, was, it's like Pony Con or something like well, that? Well, here's the thing about My Little Pony. They had, like, 17 different cons, all specifically dedicated to the My Little Pony. But I think the big one... Oh, God, what was it? Uh, Brony Con. Because um, that's what Jay Nicholson did the video on, right? Um, the last mm-hmm. Brony Con. Uh, so, yeah, there was... But, like, it's weird to think that... It's like, yeah, My Little Pony and The Big Lebowski have have dedicated conventions. It's like that and, like, Star Trek and Star Wars, you know? Like, I can't think of too many other movies that have a dedicated... A single movie, too. It's not like... Like, yes, there is this, technically the sequel to The Big Lebowski that we're all just going to pretend doesn't exist. But... Uh, oh, the Jesus Rolls? Yeah. Which came out, like, fucking four years ago, and we're just going to ignore. Uh, <laughs> but, like... How many times has one movie sparked a convention, right? Oh, um, well, the we can't like dismiss Avatar Con. Is there an Avatar Con? It's, yeah, it, I'm not, but like, it's, it's not. Um, it, it's all like online right now, I guess. Yeah, well, that's the conventions. I, I've, only, I've only caught this like briefly. Conventions so. now are in a weird spot post COVID. Like a lot of them have just kind of stopped. Like yeah, the, like unless a, you're like Anime Expo or San Diego Comic Con, and even those, well, actually, Anime Expo is like it's too crowded now. Well, yeah, like, now the anime ones are like where a lot of the attention is, and like they're exploding. And yeah, yeah, and, and San Diego Comic Con's like I guess attendance is down, which is good for me because I I just go there to like yeah. hang out for a couple yeah, maybe, days. <laughs> maybe they'll finally start being even... about comic books again. Not to be that fucking old. That would fogey, be really cool. But like I used to yeah. like going to like Artist Alley and shit, you know. Um, yeah, that is the the coolest stuff there. Yeah, it's like and oh, everyone's just kind of drunk for like five days straight. Yeah, which is just like there's, there's pros and cons to that, obviously. Do you remember when someone got stabbed waiting in line for the Avengers panel? What? That was like like the, the before the first Avengers. Is that movie. real? Yeah, that happened. I just, Jesus someone, Christ. No. I just remember someone. I just remember someone happy. like someone got stabbed, and the fucking Avengers were right there and did nothing. I just remember that being the joke everyone made. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think it was like I don't think it was like a brutal stabbing. I think someone got like stabbed with like a pencil or something after like you know you're waiting in line seventeen hours. <laughs> Tensions can rise. Okay. I just I just imagine it like that episode of the bear when Richie gets stabbed. I have not made it to that episode yet. My bad. Well, thanks. <laughs> well, it's it, it, it's it's. I, I'm not gonna say anything else, but if you if you know what I'm talking about, you know what I'm talking about. All right, well, it's fine. I'll see if I have this take. Uh, if I have this image in my head, I'll I'll message you about it um, when okay. it happens. 
It, it, it's not super far into the show. That's why I was surprised okay. you haven't gotten there Wait, yet. It's been a, I'm watching it with my father, so it's about, like, when can we both watch it, you know? Uh, okay. So okay. it leads to a little slow going. Um, hmm. Did you know there's Lost Media okay, in Fargo? Uh, well, wait, what was that? There's Lost Media in Fargo. I don't know. Why? Um, because wow. there, there's a scene in it towards the end where Bruce Campbell appears on the TV in a soap opera. Oh, yes, yes. And, and apparently, now this is according to Bruce Campbell, who is like, is great, but also full of shit, but in like a fun way, you know, like I'm never, mm. I'm holding it. That's a real soap opera he was on that only ran for like a short period of time and then like was never re-aired and there's no home video of it. Oh, so, I was going to ask if that was it, but I was like, no, no, it can't be that. Yeah, they clearly filmed that for the movie. No, from, <laughs> from what I understand, from I, but I, that comes from Bruce Campbell, and Bruce Campbell is a guy who does just kind of make shit up just to fuck with people, so it, it could yeah, be bullshit. Like he, he was saying like they, they were crafting an arc for, for Pizza Papa. He was yeah. like, yeah, I have a three-picture deal. <laughs> like, <it's... laughs> I mean, if that was true, it might save the Marvel Cinematic Universe. Oh no! Yeah, Pizza Papa should be the villain of Secret Wars. I would watch Secret Wars if that, that happened. Would, that would that would like look, Kevin Feige. If you have any fucking balls, you can't use Kang anymore. So, fucking <laughs> Avengers, the Pizza Papa Dynasty. Like, <laughs> no, call it call it to, for Coen Brothers reference. Call it the Pizza Papa Proxy, and he's the he's the key villain of the next Avengers film. And then I would be okay with Sam Raimi directing it. Yeah, why not? Do they have a director for Avengers fucking whatever at this point? Or is that just like... No, the rumor is, like, they're gunning hard for Raimi. Because even though, like, Multiverse of Madness was, like, mixed with the fans, like, it was generally better received than their other stuff they've been doing. Yeah. So... But also, it's one of those movies where, like... you know, he's on time and shit. Yeah, and also the story is, like, he was one of the few guys who actually knew how to work with that scale. Like... Uh, yeah. Apparently, like I mean, he, you can tell when you watch the fucking movie. Yeah, and um, so I, w- I mean, I wouldn't be against it. It is one of those where, like, I wish Raimi. Raimi's he's supposed to be doing another horror movie again, right? Like, yeah, but yeah. That, that seems to be Sam Raimi's bit though, where he just keeps announcing horror movies and then not making them. So. Yeah, everyone got really excited. It's about, like, the Bermuda Triangle or something like that. Oh, shit. And everyone's like, oh, he's back. And I'm like, oh, we've been here before. Yeah. Did we just forget? Are we so soon to forget? Like, calm down. Yeah, we, wait, wait until the camera. Until I'm in the theater watching a film yeah. by Sam Raimi. You know? Exactly. It's, I mean, same with the Evil Dead movies where, like, the last time Evil Dead got rebooted, Bruce Campbell was out there again being like, you won't have to wait long for a sequel. And <laughs> we waited over a decade. Like, well, this this one this one actually seems true because they got like two. Uh, they I I don't. They have a, a couple things happening. Um, mm-hmm. Well, yeah, yeah. They're... They they definitely have one coming up. Mm-hmm. What's that? What, there's what, what, there's what? more than that. There's there's more. What? I I I don't I don't know what's out there or not. But there's there's is... stuff happening, and it's not just the. The quasi spinoff that they just announced, or whatever. Oh, they announced it. I, I haven't really paid. I just paid attention. There's like, there's one that's going to be like set in France, something like that. Was I heard the rumor? No, no, it's just directed by a French guy, oh. and everyone was like, "Oh Jesus!" <laughs> I mean, the French are fucked up. They can do Evil Dead. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And then I don't know if you follow Mr. Chow on Twitter, but he was like, "Imagine being possessed by the French." <laughs> <or fine." laughs> Where? Like, all right. Uh, no offense, Diego. It started with you. Where did the anti-French sentiment come from all of a sudden? Like, just look at them. <laughs> all right, but like, it felt like it went away for a little bit. Now we're back to being like, "Fuck the French." I, they're just so pretentious. I think. I think what really solidified it was when I went last year. And look, the the people I actually like spoke to and stuff were were all very nice. Mm. But there is an air when you're walking around the street. And uh, if you're clearly not French, they definitely look at you a certain way. Well, yeah, and if you're and American, I just didn't appreciate that. If you're American, they also look at you a certain way. Um, yeah, yeah, but I only get patriotic when we're going up against the French or the British because then I'm like, what gives you the fucking right? I, yeah, I get you it. guys started this. Well, look, I get it more with the British, but the French. Every now and then we go to we go to conflict with them where it's like 
France won't let us like fly our bombers over their airspace, which I'm like, I'm kind of okay with that. <laughs> like, or, yeah, or, yeah. Or them, like, I mean, that was, you know, Freedom Fries, where they wouldn't support us during the Iraq War, a thing that actually happened where suddenly oh, yeah. In, our, yeah, that was pretty cool. in our government buildings, we couldn't call them French Fries anymore. We had to call them Freedom Fries. And, and our generation is supposed to be too soft. <laughs> I, I know, right? <laughs> fucking... Like not to not to bang that old drum, but like good fucking. It's Lord. a good drum. Yeah, <laughs> it's a sturdy drum. Um, yeah, I don't know how we got there, but yeah. Uh, anyways, Bruce Campbell's in this for us for a, right. literally like a, like a millisecond. Yeah, you wouldn't even notice he's technically not in it. He's on the TV, but yeah. Hey, um, all right. What do you want? What where do you want to start with Fargo? Because we could like really start anywhere um is Frances McDormand one of the most underappreciated actresses because she has like she's gotten so much like awards love Mm -hmm. but I feel like she's not like until the campaign start up again everyone kind of forgets about her unless you're like a a fucking movie obsessive or something you know what I mean versus like Amy Adams who needs a new agent because we all like do like her like, everyone loves Amy Adams. Like, just like, oh, yeah, she's great. Yeah. I wish she had better roles, well, you know? Well, that's the funny thing about Amy Adams is that, like, everyone seems to love her, and, like, I can't remember the last time she's picked a good movie, you know? Like, not to, not to be that the dick. Woman in the Window. Banger. Uh, yeah, that movie blows. I don't know what the fuck you're talking about. Um, I think that movie's a blast. Yeah. Um, she's not in Women Talking, is she? Frances McDormand is, but... Yeah, Frances McDormand does. Yeah. Well, I think it's... The, the other weird thing about Frances is that, like, when she... Lately, when she does get mainstream no, notice, it's for, like, three billboards outside of Missouri and Nomadland, which are two movies that became, like, really divisive for no reason. I mean, the one I get. But, um, like... Yeah, yeah well, three billboards is terrible, and <laughs> she's not particularly strong in it, I would argue. I don't know. I um, liked her in it. And- that was one of the weird things about that movie for me where like I liked a lot of the performances in it but the movie wasn't very good um well that was like the, I don't I don't know that was also I don't know man that was in that weird run though where like I kept getting excited to see Peter Dinklage in things and then he was always underused like yeah Peter Dinklage being like the one underserved guy in that movie um he's in like some romantic drama comedy with Anne Hathaway coming yeah, out? Yeah, I think it came out, actually. I, I think it came out, like, at the very oh, end. Oh, really? Fuck. I want to see that, because he's that's it's his role. It's yeah. his movie. And it's supposed to be good, and he's supposed to be good in the new Hunger Games movie, too. Um, he is! Yeah. Oh, you didn't see it? No, I did not see it. Oh, if, if you like the other ones, you'll like this one. Well, it's I, not me being, like, well, facetious well, or snarky. I yeah, but I, I, I didn't like the other ones, so... Oh, then never mind. I've told you that... Um, I've told my Hunger Games story, right? Yeah. Should I tell it again? <laughs> sure, you, you didn't see the last one, but when you saw the third one, you're like, I don't know if I liked it that much, but it's the best one. <laughs> well, no, all right, here's my Hunger Games story, just to go over okay. it for people who don't remember. I I saw the first three in theaters. I saw Hunger Games, and first the first two I had the same exact problem with, which is that I really vibed with the movie until the actual Hunger Games started. Like, I didn't enjoy the actual Hunger Games part of it. Then you get to the third one, and there's no Hunger Games in it, right? Like, it's just uh-huh. the revolution. I'm in the theater with my sister walk, watching Mockingjay Part 1. There's, like, maybe 20 minutes of that movie left, and a fight breaks out in the theater. <laughs> I'm in. And we, we we leave, and we get a refund um, because the movie was interrupted. And that was that's the... the so I, I watched... Mocking Jay with 20 minutes left to go, and that's easily the best one of those movies I've seen. And I haven't seen a single Hunger Games thing since. But that was the so. Well, there's only two movies, and they took like a decade off. So. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, I don't know. Um, maybe I'll check it out. Um, so I, I just I want I want some um, someone fucking someone use Peter Dinklage correctly. Jesus Christ! Like, put him and Nathan Lane in a movie together. That's what I want. Yes, they'd be, um, they'd be perfect. I, I want to just mention Nomadland before going back to Fargo really quickly because I think that movie kind of became really controversial, I guess, just because on on some level people felt that it was like like cosplaying mm-hmm. like poverty. Well, you can. Ne- I mean, poverty. 
I don't, is there any way to do that in movies without doing it, you know? No, I don't think so. And this isn't me, like, even defending that. Mm. Like, I, I like that movie a lot. Mm. I can understand that. Um, yeah. And... And then, like, there's also, like, a documentary approach you could take with it, but I, I tend to find that exploitative as well. Like, mm -hmm. like you, everyone knows I take a, a fuck ton of photos now. Um, like, I, I don't agree with people that take photos of homeless people. I, I think it's very exploitative, and it's like, you're, you're taking advantage of these people who, who well, that, don't that's the have double, a say that's... in... in being shown. That's a double-edged sword of covering these things. Of just like you, you want you want people to like be aware of it, but you also, you no matter how you really approach it, it's going to be a little exploitative, right? Like it's yeah. I mean, it's how we talk about poverty in this country. Like where it's poverty is something to fear. You know, it's not, and mm -hmm. we don't really we don't. And then even then we so there's so few discussions around poverty. It's like hey, people shouldn't be impoverished, right? Like that should be the discussion mm -hmm. that people shouldn't be poor. But uh, we, we don't tend to look at it that way. We tend to go like, oh, look at the resilience of poor people, which drives me fucking nuts, right? Um, yeah. I now, mean, this country's so fucked up when it's like, oh, look at the, these, these hardworking people, like, uh, pulled their money together to pay for uh, their, their co-workers, like, financial struggles. Like, what an uplifting story. And it's like, hey, yeah. the uplifting story would be if they didn't have to worry about yeah. that. Yeah, people shouldn't have That's to start GoFundMes for cancer treatment. Like yeah. that shouldn't be a controversial take, right? Like, and maybe let's say hypothetically, if there was a bunch of skyscrapers in, in the downtown Los Angeles area that weren't occupied because no one can afford to live there and they're privately owned uh, and they got graffitied, I think that's the least you could do to those buildings. Yeah, I'm not going to say what else you could do to them. Yeah, well, but I, mean, I, I, I could, think, hey, you could, put... you could, you could use a lot of the money you're going to use to clean those up to just house people. Yeah. Just put people in the buildings. You got a homeless problem I hear about all the time in LA. Sounds like you got some buildings that could help take care of that problem. Yeah, uh, like, like Skid Row is technically smaller, mm -hmm. but now like the homeless population is not isolated to Skid Row because it, it's it's just it's so expansive. There's no one's taking care of these fucking people. Yeah, well, I mean that's the real kicker of it all. Supposed to go? That's, I mean, I I've, I brought this point up so many times. I'm preaching to the crowd at this point, but it is that problem of like the only solution to homelessness is to give these people homes. Like there's no other there's no other answer, and we'll just never do it. Like, I know, and and it's like we all know that there are just a bunch of empty homes all over the country now. Yeah, that, it's like the pieces are right there. We all see it, but the people who want to make money off those homes and yeah. they're not, they're like, no, 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 that that can't well, that's be. That's why that doesn't make any sense. That's why like our entire economy is fucked. Because I do like on some level, I sympathize with some people where it's like if we suddenly went like. Hey, yeah, these houses that aren't being used, we got to do something about them. That would lower, you know, technically it would lower people's like the value of their homes if they want to resell them. And people, mm -hmm. a lot of people count on the value of their house going up as like an investment. And we shouldn't have built our economy that way, but that's why people get like <laughs> weird about it. Like I'm not I'm not saying that's an excuse. I'm just saying that's why people can get like really like defensive about it. I don't agree, mm -hmm. but like it's yeah, it's it's one of those like what, like we've just built our whole economy wrong. You know, I've been thinking about that lately with like the rise of like bots on Twitter and stuff like that, and like with AI getting more and more sophisticated. Is the internet gonna just be like ninety nine percent bots at a certain point? Like it might be. I read I read once how um, a third of all internet traffic was bullshit. Like it was all like bots and stuff, and that was like a decade ago. And I can only imagine it's gotten worse since then. And if we're jet, if we are, if the value of so much stuff online is based on interaction, and we find out that ninety nine percent of it is bullshit, what do we do about that? Do we just keep pretending the lie is real? Like it seems like that's the bet everyone is taking, that we're just going to keep. Well, not I would say not everyone. I feel like it's just a specific group of people hmm. well, who are the ones who are profiting off well, of yeah, it. Obviously, you know. But at the same time, yeah. it's also like they're not. You know, nothing's actually genuinely nothing's being generated, right? It's not just mm -hmm. like something's being sold for a value that's not worth. It's genuinely no no wealth generation. So it's just crazy to me that that's what's going on. But hey, um. but speaking of financial gains, um, Jerry Lundengard, played by the great William H Macy, who's done nothing strange in the real world. Yeah, nothing um, weird happened with that guy. 
That was a crazy moment. I mean, though. <laughs> that was he. I mean, one he is like an actual Coen Brothers character, right? Obviously. Yeah. Two, in the real world, it feels like he got up in like a light Coen Brothers movie type situation, mm-hmm. like a very light version of it. Did like, you know he's oh, in? Yeah, uh, we're gonna. Did you know he's in Kingdom of the Planet of the Apes? No, I, what? I just found that out just now. Oh, okay. I, I genuinely love William H. Macy as an actor. I do, too. Um, he he doesn't pick great movies um, all the time, but he is good in them. No. He does he does have a strange vibe to him. There's, like, the story of, like, he basically had to, like, threaten the Coen brothers to get the job. Like, uh, I think the joke was he, like, read the script, and he said, like, he, he called the Coen brothers and was like, I will kill your dogs if I don't get this role. <laughs> Oh my god! As a joke, like I don't think he was like being genuine. I think it was just like him being like I had, <laughs> I had the show. I, I had a dark side to me. That's the way he tells it, and that was a cute story in the nineties. Um, <laughs> but but uh, uh, it's the only time he worked with them, right? Uh, he, I can't imagine why after hearing that. <laughs> well, there are a few people like that where it's like they they, they have their regulars, but then they have sometimes where it's like, you know, they only work with James Gandolfini one time. Um, they only work with uh they they only work with um what's his name sling blade what's that actor's name uh billy bob thornton right they only work with him one time. oh yeah 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 and they 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 they, they, they secretly write bad santa but that's about it uh they only work with brad pitt one time uh damon i think one time at this point like they, they seem to do that occasionally like they'll bring in like one big name actor and that's the only time they work with them uh, but then they have like yeah. but they... you got the filmmakers who like really love like their crew their mm. groups mm. and then other ones who are just like they're they're more committed yeah. to like they have some just people the production and the, the the system they have some people who they'll work with multiple times like obviously Frances McDormand but that's because she's married to one of them and uh, yeah. but then yeah. you know you get like you get uh, Goodman you get Buscemi although Buscemi I don't think has worked with them since Big Lebowski right like. It's been a minute. Oh, shit. Even, I don't think so. No. Yeah, it's which is kind of crazy when you consider that like he's such a like people think when people think of the Coen Brothers they think of Buscemi or the other way around. Uh, the cra- yeah, the, huh. the craziest for me is uh, Miller's Crossing, where it's like they have Gabriel Byrne and Albert Finney in it, and that's the only time they ever worked with those two, right? Like you feel like Gabriel Byrne could have popped mm-hmm. up in other Coen Brothers shit. But, oh, yeah, yeah. But the only two that carry over is, like, John Polito and John Turturro. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, my neighbor, John Turturro. Um, Peter Stormare is only in a couple, too, right? I think it's, he's also only, like it's only Big this Lebowski. and Big Lebowski. And the story is they wrote a role for him in Miller's Crossing, which I don't know what... I think it's the role... I think it's... It's either that guy who like uh, is kind of like the manager of the 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 club that um, Albert Finney works out of, or it's it's one of the bartender type characters in it. Like he was okay. gonna he was gonna. Have... I I fucking love Peter Stormare. Whenever he pops up, <laughs> I'm like, oh yeah, there he is. <laughs> He's like one of the great character actors right now. I would hate to find out there's anything weird about him. I genuinely don't know. The only, um, the only I thing don't want to know. The only thing I know about him is that uh, he's he's very he's religious and has claimed to have spoken directly to God. So not the okay. Weir- if that's as weird as it gets, yeah. I'm cool with it. Well, been plenty <laughs> of move on. Been plenty of weirder guys in Hollywood. Yeah, <laughs> but he's it's like okay. But he's also yeah. one of those guys who, like, his career trajectory is so odd. Like, it's, like, the mm-hmm. movies he does. Like, this is the only time he works with the Coen brothers. He's briefly, like, he's in Michael Bay movies. <laughs> he's yeah. he's in Jurassic Lost World Jurassic Park. Like, right off of this, he does Lost World Jurassic Park, Armageddon, and Mercury Rising. Like, it's kind of nuts. Uh yeah, he has a, and then I think a lot of people of our generation know him for those old Volkswagen commercials. Yeah, uh, where like he was like, and the, and that campaign didn't actually last as long as you remember it in your mind. Like he only did it for like two years, but for a lot of people our generation, that's how we know him. Um, yeah, he's very very interesting career for someone. 
Um, Bizzle? Yeah. Um, he he also pops up in like the Last Stand, John Wick, oh, yeah, yeah. Chapter Two, in the opening of that. Mm-hmm. John- like he, I mean, he's like perfect for the John Wick movie. He is. Like, yeah. It's kind of amazing that he wasn't just in the first one. You know, <laughs> like he feels like he's essential his, to, to the fabric of those movies. His inclusion in the second one kind of feels like one of those things where it's like they wanted him for the first one but couldn't get him, so he's in the second one. Um, mm-hmm. But he is good. He's, it's cool. He's in, only in that opening. John Wick's so weird. Where like they have like so many great actors and like bit parts that then never come back. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Which is I'm just not yeah, even a I complaint. Kind of wish... I I kind of like it. It's like interesting, but uh... no, no, yeah, yeah, I, I like it too. But another part of me is always like I, I do wish we went back to like him and like John Leguizamo yeah. at some point. Leguizamo's one of the fine. F- we don't need to. Leguizamo's one of the few who was in like two of them. So. Yeah. Like, it's kind of interesting. Uh, yeah, and, like, usually with, like, a, a franchise, I get a little annoyed with that, you know, where I'm mm-hmm. like, no, well, you, you got these other guys already. Go back to them. But mm-hmm. it, it's not a problem there. Mm-hmm. I don't know why. Um, yeah, uh, Stormare and Buscemi, obviously, are, like, uh, real highlights in this. Yeah. I mean, the whole movie's a highlight. No one, like, steals the movie for me. Um, but I, I think those are two of my favorite, like coen brothers characters well it's also honestly it's, yeah it's, I, don't, I don't know how you feel no but it's also one of those great like coen brothers movies where like the minor characters are also great like people have like two mm. scenes stan grossman being one of my favorites uh, <laughs> just you ask stan grossman he'll tell you like, it's just they bring the fucking business manager in on like the kidnapping negotiations like it's yeah. it's so funny that the thing that that set like really fucks everything up for jerry uh, is that, like, they make a dumb, like, corporate business decision about handing over the money, you know? Such a, like, yeah. that the decision of, like, no, hit, Wade will handle it is such a, like, last-minute, like, corporate guy wanting to take credit for something move. Like, it is, it's such a middle manager having to justify his existence by suggesting something moment. And it, yeah. it le- oh, well, we just need to go over your finder's fee. Yeah. Ex- oh, that's such a brutal scene. Um, well, I know. well, that's the other really cool thing about this movie in terms of like the fucking the downfall of Jerry Lundegaard is that he's so full of shit. Like you don't realize how full of shit he is at the start, but it is such a like mm-hmm. it's his ego that has caught like that has fucked him. You know, he he he, yeah. he doesn't really. He owes money, but it's his own fucking fault, and it's because he can't just be like, he can't just go to his father-in-law and be like, I fucked up. He has to, because like, she'd probably get the family out of a jam, but it wouldn't get Jerry out of the jam, right? Like, that's the whole thing of, like, Gene and Scotty never have to worry. And yeah. It's, and you also, you read between the lines of it and wonder how much, did he, did he marry, did he marry her? Just because, like, she was the boss's daughter, you know? Like, how craven mm-hmm. has this guy been his whole fucking life? And, uh, yeah. Like, when, when I first saw this movie, it's like, um, he, he's got, like, these big, sad, almost, like, puppy dog eyes. Mm-hmm. You know? So, at the start, I, I do kind of just feel, like, bad for him. Mm-hmm. And then, as the, obviously, as the narrative progresses, I'm like, oh, no, he's he's just, like, a piece of shit. Yeah. Um, and, like, you know, on some level, I do feel a little bad. Like, dude, you don't have to fucking... Be, you don't have to be this person. Yeah. <laughs> um, but, like, it's, it's too late. He is that person. That is not... He doesn't have to resolve anything. He's just a fucking asshole. Um, and uh, I, I really love the scene where uh, after they, they, they take Gene, he's, um, he's like, talking. Oh, like, yeah. It, it, he's, out, he's out of the, the view of the camera. He's, like, behind a wall. And he's, like... It sounds like he's talking on the phone to report... the. Like, uh, uh, the kidnapping and then the, the camera like goes over to him and he's like hyping himself up for the phone call yeah. and that's just like oh god well, what a piece of shit the great kicker is him like working himself up being like I don't know what to do Gene's been kidnapped like he does like multiple takes of it then he dials a number and he's like ready to go and he does that like uh oh wait Gusterson please <laughs> <It's>, yes <laughs> it's so fucking funny that's the other thing I mean I think this might be what confuses some people maybe when it's their first movie is how fucking funny this movie is like it yeah. is so goddamn funny and it's mixed with this insane darkness to it that I think it throws some people and I think it leads people to I don't know 
the take of how how cruel exactly the Cohen brothers are. You know, like it's mm-hmm. I don't know exactly where I fall on that because I've heard people make the argument, but it, it just seems like they have a very dark sense of humor about life, right? Um, and mm-hmm. one some I can I can just oddly relate to. Like that, like I've been through some fucking horrible shit in my life, and then when I also like look at it from a distance, there's there are funny moments in there, you know. Uh, yeah, um, and I, maybe that's what kind of kept me at arm's distance when I was younger. Um, and I'll be honest, it's not that I didn't even go through some hmm. very difficult stuff. I don't think I acknowledged how difficult and awful some of the stuff. I went through was until I got older. Yeah. And I think like understanding that helped me get into the wavelength of like really dark comedy stuff, honestly. Yeah. Well, I, yeah. Um, I, not to, not, not to, exclusively, not, but yeah, <laughs> not to be too judgmental of people. But I do kind of feel like people that struggle with dark comedies have maybe not confronted those like dark moments of their own life or just their realities. You know, like I think mm. there's something to the dark comedy, specifically the Coen brothers where it, it's, like people be like, why would you watch a movie where like a bunch of people get murdered and like it's also funny? And there there's something cathartic about a movie like this where it's good to know someone else realizes how fucked up life can be. Like I think it's good to like, cause, I mean, like I've I've read a lot of true crime and a lot of true crime is a lot closer to this than like Manhunter, right? Where it's just like some yeah. idiot somewhere wanted money and in that pursuit of money they got a bunch of fucking people killed, like. It's like it happens so often, and that's what most crime is, and it's over bullshit like that. And it's sometimes it helps to know that someone else sees how fucked up it is, <laughs> and and isn't just like gonna make just like, like they do make a very moralistic statement at the end of the movie. I feel like with the whole like all this over a little bit of money, but it it feels I don't know. Um, there's 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 more to it than just a basic statement like that uh, of just a certain like why do we keep doing these things to each other? There's, like it's you know the I mean to quote Big Lebowski it's like the whole darn human comedy that keeps on perpetuating itself. And I think I think they I just think they get it like it's it's they, their movies seem to have a worldview that's very similar. Not just to me, but I think to a lot of people of just like the, the weird like juxtaposition of life of just like there's there's really great and funny stuff in it and also just horrific shit and we have to kind of reconcile that with us and I think that comes a lot from their Judaism as well I think a serious man is a big kind of statement about that right um, mm-hmm. like I think honestly I think a serious man might be the movie that's like a, the key to unlocking their whole filmography uh, but that's a that's a different discussion <laughs> yeah. Uh, um, obviously I got to shout out my boy Roger Deakins um, mm-hmm. there's an excellent commentary by him on this um, but he's always very like humble about it he's like yeah I guess we could start talking about the movie now <laughs> <laughs> like, and he's like yeah you know it was cold Mean- it, meanwhile um, this has one of the he'll... greatest opening shots of all time which is like the white like you think it's just pure white until like that bird like floats in the frame for like half a second and the road slowly comes into view and the car mm-hmm. like that's one of the most amazing opening shots of all time yeah and that was done by Deacon's assistant and I'm sorry I, I don't have the name in front of me but uh, because the 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 weather wasn't like the snow wasn't giving them what they wanted. Yeah, I think it was like an El, and, he, and he talks. To, it was an El Nino year, I think, in nineteen whenever mm. whenever they were filming it, and they so there wasn't snow on the ground in North Dakota, so they had to like go all over the Midwest for places with actual snow. <laughs> well, they also had to create a, a bunch of it with yeah. ice chipping machines. Mm-hmm. He calls it so. Yeah, yeah he, uh, he said it was one of the least snowy years on record. Mm-hmm. Or, um, and uh but yeah when he was he was able to just send out his assistant because they were so ready to go they knew the locations they knew the like the exact angles of the camera and the lenses so he was like yeah you could just go do that Mm -hmm. and it's like yep that's what good preparation does for you (laughs) and i don't know that's just like there's a there's a certain level of um like just just candidness with deacons that I think I, I really really love mm-hmm. where it's like 
he's this great artist, but he's like, yeah, you know, you just got to be prepared. You could try that. And if it doesn't work, you try something else. And so, yep, there you go. You got it. <laughs> um, uh, he tends to shoot this movie, uh, or he tends to shoot close-ups. Um, I don't know if, uh, maybe like, I'm sure he's fucking, everyone's seen clips of him talking about this, but he loves shooting close-ups on like variations of 20 to 30 millimeter lenses in between people having yeah, conversations. Yeah. So it makes you feel like you're more, you're in the middle of the discussion. He doesn't really like the over the shoulder stuff unless, you know, it's for like a reason. And I think um, there's some like over the shoulder stuff in this movie that uh, uh, keeps you at a distance from the characters when they're like, uh, like, like when Marge is trying to like figure out, like, like I solve uh, the case and like figure out Jerry's deal, you mm-hmm. know? It's like very specific utilization of the camera that. Um, it, it's not a flashy movie, is the thing. But it's so specific in its construction um, that it ends up almost feeling, like, flashy. The dialogue is, like, very flashy, yeah. I think, though. Well, I the mean, dialogue's very, like... Over-exaggerated, uh, like, Minnesota nice-type accents and shit like that. Yeah. Um, I mean- oh, oh, you say over-exaggerated. <laughs> um, th- those two girls that are interviewed by Marge... Mm-hmm actually spoke like that. I, I can imagine, but I also say that because I know people from Minnesota get really offended if you say this is what they sound like. <laughs> oh, that's hilarious. <laughs> Even though they do um, sound like this. Um, no offense, but... Yeah. I mean, I, I mean, uh, shout out to friend of the show, um, uh, Cameron Carpenter, who is from Kentucky, and he's always very vocal about how, like, some Southern accents or, like, Kentucky-type accents, like, in movies that people think are exaggerated... He's like, no, if anything, they're, like, too subtle. <laughs> like, <laughs> people sound ridiculous in real life. Like, it just happens. Yeah. It doesn't mean there's lesser quality of character. Uh, uh, it's just a thing that happens. One of the few great things about living in America is the diversity of accents in this country, which are all fascinating and hysterical at the same time. <laughs> so, I mean, you know, there's Philly accents, there's New York accents. Those are funny, too. <laughs> like, there's one's not... Is What is the most boring accent in America? New York or California? No, no, New York's not boring. Like, really, like, strong New York, right? Like... Oh, yeah, yeah, I guess you're right. Maybe, maybe California? Yeah, I want to say California, except for maybe, like, surfers. Like, surfer, the surfer accent's kind of fun. But there is kind of, like, the oh, generic yeah. uh, California accent that isn't the best. Um, but, like, this what about is... about Oregon? Does Oregon even have an accent? What is that? Um, Oregon doesn't exist. Yeah, it's it's just like a bunch of trees. That's one of those states where it's like four people every square mile, right? Like, yeah, <laughs> I could be wrong, but we have a few states like that. Uh, I mean, is that the slogan for this movie? A lot can happen in the middle of nowhere. I think that's that was one of the taglines for this movie. Uh, that's a good one. It is a pretty good one. But this is one of those movies that I've like, like my whole family like quotes this movie all the time. Um, I mean, I, I can't, like, every now and then one of us will just slip into the fucking Mr. Moira, the, the witness who basically solves the whole case. Or, <laughs> or just attend to Necklin and Switland last night, and this guy comes in, where can guy get some action? <laughs> like, that scene, that might be my favorite Coen Brothers scene in general in any movie. <laughs> like, just that guy who, like, calls me a jerk, only he don't use the word jerk. Like, and that guy had all the info. He had, like, if he, that guy doesn't say anything, Marge doesn't go and check out the lake for the car. <laughs> like, yeah. it's, that guy cracked the whole case right there. It's <laughs> <laughs> one of my favorite scenes in any movie. Um, got, you know, John Carroll Lynch. We also got him in this. Oh, yeah, uh, yeah. As Norm, with just the three cent stamp. Um, after all, all his wife does, he has to be reassured about just getting the three cent stamp. I yeah. know. <laughs> People need the three cent stamp when they raise the post. And see, even they're worried about money. Yeah. But they're not Jerry. Yeah. Well, yeah, I mean, that's the fucking point of the movie right there. Like, yeah. People need the little stamp, right? And that's why, so it's always weird to me when, like, people go, like, the Coen brothers are nihilists, because that doesn't seem like a nihilistic point of view. Like, it seems like a very positive one, ultimately. Like, the fight, like, I could just be wrong. Like, and there have been darker Coen Brothers movies, 
But the vibe I always get from them is that, like, they think the world is, like, fucked up and violent and awful, but, like, there's goodness in it, right? Like, mm-hmm. that's, that's always been my vibe. Am I wrong? No, no, I think you're correct. And I mean, like, just this little bit, the little dialogue exchange between Norm and Marge, and, and she's like, you know, we got it pretty good, don't we? And I'm like, oh, like, it's, I, that's, like, so sweet, <laughs> you know? And I mean, I think, I always say, I think it says a lot that their next movie is The Big Lebowski, where there are nihilists in it, straight up nihilists, and they basically exist just to get clowned on at the end of the movie. Like, mm-hmm. I don't think they would do that. I think that feels like a direct response to some of their critics. But, uh, yeah. yeah. I mean, even like, yeah, I think it's like, maybe it's just a more recent trend that they have this um, this reputation, too, because it's like, Raising Arizona, that's a that's a pretty wacky movie. Yeah, but at the same time, I think you know? yeah, but I, I I think I get where the nihilism comes because I mean they just they they do the violence with the comedy so often, and people just seem to like die for very arbitrary reasons that I think it can throw people sometimes. I mean this movie, I like we talk about this movie is insanely dark, right? Like every, oh yeah, everyone talks about the wood chipper and stuff, but like some of the really dark stuff in it is just like the amount of innocent people that get killed. That had nothing to do with the crime. They were just in the wrong place at the wrong time. And then the big one for me is always the, like, after the money handoff goes wrong and fucking Wade gets, I mean, yeah, Wade gets shot and, like, the fucking poor guy just doing the ticket booth gets shot and mm-hmm. all that shit. And fucking Buscemi gets shot in the face and goes back and he even, like, he divides up the money for his, his partner. Uh, like, he gets back and she's already dead. Like, had, the th- had everything gone right, fucking she still would have ended up dead right like mm-hmm. there wasn't a like it it's it's so it's so awful for no reason we never really find out what happened there we just just because fucking stormare is such a sociopath in this but like at some point he just fucking killed her and and both of them just like shrug it off like even michelle like what the hell happened to her and the guy just started yelling I'm like that's it and like that's that's dark that's that, yeah that's fucking dark yeah. man uh, but there are like those like really flippant moments that maybe rub people. The one that's pretty brutal is uh, Macy getting to the handoff a little too late, and he comes across his father-in-law just dead. And you just there's just that mm. there's that they just hold on it for a minute. Like we don't see his reaction. We just see the car parked in front of it, and then you then you see the trunk of the car open up, and that's the end of the scene. Like that he's made his decision in like that quick moment. Uh, mm-hmm. It's it's so. It's, it's it's brutal ultimately like it's, it's very cold and not just because of the snow yeah you know why is it's why is very appropriate setting why are snowy locations so good for crime stories like why does it work you know huh i don't know maybe there's something about like when people think of like winter uh, or at least like snow, like you know, you hear Winter Wonderland and stuff like that, and it's like, oh, the snow's so fun, it's good. It's like it's an environment that's that's harsh, but we we tend to romanticize a little bit, yeah. and then with like a level of, of of bleakness and violence, like it just kind of reminds you that yeah, nature can also be that. Well, no, um, yeah, I mean, not that s- human nature s- is, snow, but literal nature. Snow and winter often always like sick will often you know signify death and shit, right? Like. It's, mm-hmm. it's, you know, whiteness and like, it's just cold. And it's really one of those, like you, the opening shot of this, it's like, no one should be fucking living here. Right. Like this is, <laughs> inhuman. although I love the snow. I love it. I love winter time. I love just being cozy in a house with just a blanket on when I can't go outside. So I don't fucking know. I'm an idiot, but, uh, yeah, there's something it's, it, it leads to an interesting I don't know. It just, it just, it really seems to work. It keeps recurring, and it will recur on this podcast at least once more before this retrospective's over. For anyone who followed, oh, really? Our, Wait, which one? For anyone who followed oh, our don't poll, say it, don't say it. Um, you should know it was your choice. Oh, <laughs> oh yeah, it was my choice. Yeah, sorry about that. We should talk about. Uh, I'm sure it'll be fine. It'll be fine. We should talk about uh, Steve yeah. Park as Mike Yadikita. Uh, yeah, which uh, is a interesting moment in. Uh, the movie. Um, he appears again, by the way. He's in, uh, he's in a serious man, another Coen Brothers film for like two minutes, as Clive's father, uh, the the kid who tries to bribe him, 
um, shows up where he's like, uh, you know, like either you take the bribe or uh, if you claim we gave you a bribe, we'll sue you for defamation. Is basically that scene. Um, mm-hmm. And he's and he's recently become kind of a. Uh, he's been in the last two fucking Wes Anderson movies, a French Dispatch yeah. and Asteroid City. Um, mm-hmm. He's in Snowpiercer for like half a second. <laughs> It's one of the guards. The guys had an interesting career. Yeah, no, I, I don't, I don't have too much to add, but yeah, I, I really like him as an actor. He's and really good, and his, his anything to shout out, uh, Asteroid City as well. Well, we don't need to shout out that piece of shit. But uh, whoa, whoa, <laughs> failed award contender for next season. I, I will pull a gun on this podcast <laughs> if that happens, but. Um, no, no. I, I know you don't have anything to add. Well, also, he's also like he's he's a known advocate. I've read this story where um he he wrote some he wrote some paper. I can't remember for what, but about uh like defending kind of like Asian American representation of media all the way back in the nineties because he wrote like about like wit- oh he wrote like witnessing a racist racist incident on the set of uh, Friends when he had a guest role on mm. it. Um, and uh, yeah, he's you know he's been an advocate for that kind of stuff. Um. It's just he's interesting. It's, okay, so he rocks. Yeah, there's been a few guys like that that pop up every now and then um, in these type of movies. Uh, the one guy uh, in this, he's only on the phone. Riley Diefenbach, the guy who calls up about like I can't read the darn thing, and uh, mm-hmm. he's uh, he's the funeral director in Big Lebowski, uh, and he's uh, he's in a serious man on the phone again as the guy from the Columbia Record Company. That's like you uh you owe us money, remember? Uh he's like, mm-hmm. Well if you don't if you don't answer the thing, it's like, but I didn't do anything. And, don't want whatever. I just been in a terrible car accident. Uh, <laughs> uh there's a lot it's they have an interesting I'm I'm always just kind of amazed about like the, the minor characters, the minor people that reappear in Cohen Brothers films. Um, well, I mean, they do such a good job of like flushing everyone out, like yeah. even with just like, like a like a, a voice performance, yeah. you know, which is like really incredible. But Mike Yadikita's it's breakdown, a, it's a real testament to their power. Yeah, Mike Yadikita's breakdown though is like key is like a key Coen Brothers moment, just because of the whole like, it's because of that when she finds out he was like full of shit, that's what gets her to go back and like talk to William H Macy again because she realizes something doesn't add up, and it's such a like weird note to throw into the movie. And it's even funnier when you consider that the movie is like lying about being a true story. Can you imagine if this was a true story and the Mike Yadakita scene was in it? Like, why would that be in any movie based on true events? <laughs> like, um, I think this, this, I mean, look, I think the story reality can be fucking psychotic. Yeah. Sometimes. But like, you would never include that in the retelling of it, you know? Like you, I, I guess not. Yeah, you wouldn't do that. But uh, I think the funny thing is, I the story I believe is that they wanted to ch- do a true crime story, couldn't find a good enough one, so they just made one up, and then they just treat. That's it. amazing. But I mean, I think what's cool about this movie is it does have the vibe of a true crime story, like a good one, you know, like one where it's like, oh, mm-hmm. this is like why this stuff, even though it's totally fictitious. <laughs> Like you can even put together like here's who the witnesses were like after the fact, right? Like I think it's interesting that mm-hmm. like Shep Proudfoot and Jerry Lundegaard are like the two survivors of the whole thing. So like you can kind of imagine like this trial that would have followed, which it's just it, it puts interesting thoughts in my mind when I watch the movie, like trying to piece it together like that. Uh gosh, it's just a good movie. It's just such, like I don't you know, there's only so many ways I can say that it's but it's just such a fucking great movie. Oh. Yeah, no, it, it's a movie that, that I don't think you can really, like, overhype even. Yeah. Which is funny to say because it's not like a fucking, like, well, it, it is a banger, but when people say bangers, I think they assume, like, crowd pleaser. I don't know, this but one it's just, like, kind you, you of... You can't really oversell Fargo, like, it's just that good. This one does kind of have a crowd pleasing vibe. Like, I, I think this plays with the average person a little better than some other Coen Brothers movies. Like my grandmother loved this. In that movie, sense, yes, so. but like I guess when I say crowd pleaser, I mean like Avengers Endgame. Applause <laughs> moments and stuff. Yeah. Well, f- well, Far- Fargo's one of those ones. Like again, where, like I could we could talk about it for four hours, but I think it'll be a lot of being like this scene's great. Like, uh, and I'm I, I try not to. I don't want to say stuff that I feel like too many people have said. So um, yeah, I mean, yeah, th- this is the. I'm gonna try to be more 
perceptive of like picking movies that are not just like universally beloved. Yeah. Um, with with the rare occasion, um, just because like, yeah, of all the Coen Brothers movie, I I think this is definitely one that's that's been talked about like extensively. Yeah. Um. I just uh um, there's like specific sequences uh that I really love um like when Jerry's walking back to the car in the snow yeah and it looks like a fucking postcard <laughs> it is just it's it's so brutal like emotionally and it's so like pathetic um they were actually supposed to have like a bunch of fucking cars there I don't I don't know if, like how many people know that like it was supposed to be like a filled parking lot and then deacon's just like ah maybe just have him be alone (laughs) like because i guess they were having trouble booking the cars anyways well still this is a seven million dollar budget even in the 90s that's not a lot like you know yeah um and it's only seven million because hudsucker proxy was a big bomb well yeah this is their bounce back after hudsucker like they they tried a studio film it didn't work and now they're doing this and Mm. Um, yeah, and I, then everyone loves him now. Yeah, I mean I, that is such a picturesque shot of just like him walking through there. I always wonder like what the implication of it is though. <laughs> like, of although I don't know if you have this where like there are those office buildings where you're like, I've driven past them and never see like I see like two or three cars in the parking lot and I'm like who the fuck works there? Like, yeah, it's but like you can tell people are there because there's lights on, right? Like, and mm-hmm. it's it's clearly not nothing. But then you're like, w- what is it? <laughs> Oh, so I just saw American Psycho uh, at a place called Rooftop Cinema Club. So it's like uh, at the top of like a hotel theater, right? It's outdoors. Wow. And you know the it, it was really cool. Uh, you you do you should bring a blanket. Um, it, it gets very windy. <laughs> um, but it was a blast. And uh, around us are a bunch of skyscrapers. Uh, and then office lights were like turning on late. So I. I I don't know. Like, you never really know who's 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 up there. You know, that's I know that's not what you're suggesting. No, no, no. Um, I, I get it. Too. I always, but like it, it's just I, no, no. There is that weird. Um, I I've looked out on like a cityscape at night, and you're like, like I've been in you know, like you're in some city, and like it's like three a.m. and you can't sleep, and you look out the window and you see lights on in office buildings, and you're just like, what's, yeah. What's going on? It's, and it could be anything. It could be like it could be a janitor. It could be someone left the light on. But there is something ominous about it. Uh, just any any sort of corporate structure like that, and then it is that weird thing of just like such a large parking lot of just like pointlessness. But <laughs> mm-hmm. well, when he's like scraping the ice off the car, off the the windshield, it's like I don't know. I I, I mean, I, I think this all goes together like the 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 picturesque look mm-hmm. of that parking lot when he's walking above it, right? Like it's not so much like a a big statement about like the systems he's surrounded by or anything like that, but I do think it, it does a great job of making him feel just so small. Yeah. You know, like, it literally makes him feel small, like, visually. But it's like, yeah, that's what he feels in that moment, even though he's, like, a scumbag. It's like... And I like the patheticness... It's an impactful moment. I like the patheticness of him, like, getting in the car and then seeing that the windshield is, is iced up and then getting out of the car again. Like, he doesn't even... It doesn't even register to him. <laughs> When he's looking from the outside, he's so kind of like dead inside. <laughs> like he just yeah. he just hops in, and and there's that like he just has that moment where he kind of like cracks for a moment, and you kind of get that look of like oh what's going on under the surface. Yeah. Another thing though, if that meeting had yeah. gone well, his wife still was getting kidnapped. Like he didn't even mm-hmm. it, it was secondary to him to actually stop it. Like yeah. it's, it's almost like the universe for half a second like. Gave him a moment being like, you can stop this. Like, he, he wasn't going to get rewarded, obviously. But had he mm-hmm. maybe put in a modicum more of effort, maybe he could have told his wife, like, hey, don't be home today, right? Like, asked her, like, hey, could you run some yeah. errands for me? And she wouldn't have been home when they tried to kidnap her. It maybe could have, you know, stopped things. But instead, he, he, he did, like, the, it was secondary to actually getting the money, which is crazy. Um, he's such a pe- Now, here's something. and that I, I don't know this enough about cars, but I, it was just something I thought of while watching it this time. He's trying to push that, like, true coat shit on everyone, mm-hmm. like, to kind of, like, upsell them on the car, which is apparently something that happened to one of the Coen brothers, <laughs> that, uh, and that's why they included it. Uh, and I wonder if the, like, his, his windshield icing up so quickly is a reference that he doesn't even have the true coat that helps with the oxidization problems, 
in the car. Oh. <laughs> that, like, he's so full of shit he doesn't even have it for himself. No, he's the type of pathetic that that would track so. for me anyways. Like, and then, you know, you get that great bit with the, the couple coming into the the, the yep. auto place. And and that one guy is just, like, pissed. You're, you're, you're a liar. <laughs> Oh, yeah, fucking liar. the husband. <laughs> like his wife has to like, calm down. Like that's the one moment that guy's ever snapped. His yeah, <laughs> like this poor uh, little guy. <laughs> but, I mean, oh my god, there's so much. I mean, I've been, have you ever been to like like in like you know used car dealership offices and shit like that? Uh, yeah, they're and, depressing. You know, I think it it captures that vibe kind of perfectly. Like it's some of the worst. It's the used car dealerships have some of the worst vibes on the planet. Yeah, like <laughs> of of. Just, I mean that; those are the two worst vibes. It's like yeah. car dealerships and morgues. Yeah. Now morgues aren't that bad, actually. Well, well, well there's <laughs> dead bodies in morgues. Okay, dead bodies definitely sour any occasion, <laughs> but I think on their own. But here's the thing: it's like I think it's con- we should consider how much. Uh, morgues aren't bad with all the dead bodies around. Like, there's a massive deficit that they almost worked themselves out of. I'm, I, I'm just bullshitting. I've never been to a morgue. <laughs> <laughs> I've been to funeral homes, though, and those just... They have weird vibes because everyone's so polite to you, and then I'm just like, shut the fuck up. You're trying to get me to buy a coffin. <laughs> like, I, like, you don't, have to, you don't be my friend. Yeah, it's <laughs> like, not like... You're making you're making money off this. You don't have to pretend you actually care that my grandfather passed yeah, away. Yeah, yeah, like the, the vibes there, you, you can't really like it. It's not pleasant for anyone. Yeah, that's why I just spread my ashes fucking wherever. You know what, though? I don't want to get cremated. Oh, really? Like, I don't know why. Like, I want to get buried. But also, I'm like, don't bother with the coffin. Oh, just like raw dog. Like, just dig earth. a hole and throw me in. Like, it's because, like, like, I don't need the other yeah, just bullshit. Just give you to the worms. Yeah, it's like, I, I, like this part of it's like return to the earth. Yeah, like I don't know if I want to be ashes. Like I just want to return to the earth. Exactly. Like it's I don't know. I, I like that. I'm, I'm that's where I lean. But like, yeah, I, I agree. I also don't like the whole like rigmarole you have to go through with fucking planning a funeral and shit like that. Yeah. God damn. Here, here's father. the thing. Here's the thing. Here's... So it doesn't matter what age you are. Mm-hmm. Just. Get your shit in order, please. Get all your your wills, your paperwork, everything in order. Mm-hmm. Because if you don't, it's it's a big fucking process. It's a lot of shit to go through. It's very time consuming and draining. So get that <laughs> fucking shit in order, like now. It, it doesn't any age. You, you could be any age. Okay, just have yeah, that I've, set up. No, no, I I have had that conversation a few yes, times. Yes, talk to talk to the people okay. in your life. That conversation usually comes when my dad's like, yeah, I'm going to go jet skiing at age 60. I'm just like, yeah, fucking have that will in order, old man. Like, you're going to you're gonna fucking die of pink eye because he won't go to the doctor when he's, like, bleeding out of his ears or some shit. Like, <laughs> so I'm just like, is the will in order? Fuck it. Like, <laughs> but no, I totally get it, yeah. Uh, trying to think um yeah the other good note and i'll I'll talk about this because then i think this can segue into talking about the tv show a little bit which i think we both want to talk about somewhat i love the uh jerry getting arrested scene that comes at the very end after he's fleeing the interview after he flees um and first there's the just knock at the door i can't remember what his fake name was but they're like mr johnson you just hear him go who (laughs) (laughs) he's so bad at this and and they're like, is this your car right here? He's like, yeah, just a second. And they just break it. And there's just like, that's such the like pathetic, like, because at that point he's, it's not really jail. I think he's afraid. it's the humiliation of having to stand in, for up for these crimes. Mm-hmm. Right. Like it's, he's so cravenly just trying to get away with it. I think it's the humiliation he's avoiding more than anything else, you know? And I will say this again, like not to be, bring up like my true crime thing, but the, uh, the, the amount of true crime stories I've seen where people have decided that murder is a better option than public humiliation is kind of crazy. Like that's yeah, strange. I, it, crazy. There is What's something in the human condition that we just, we, we are so afraid of the shame we will get that we would rather kill someone than uh, like just be publicly exposed as a bad person. Mm-hmm. Right. Like it's, I, I, I don't understand it. Like that, that really throws me. Um, 
I mean, that's kind of like the Scott Peterson thing of just, like, he wanted to leave his pregnant wife, but, like, didn't want the humiliation of leaving a pregnant wife, so he killed her. Like, although isn't he getting, like, isn't there, like, a retrial happening with him? Oh, I have no idea. Like, some crazy, I think that, well, here's what's crazy. I think if I remember, let me look it up real quick, because it's kind of nuts. Um, Scott Peterson. Um, no, not Scott Pilgrim. Um, <laughs> Scott, Scott Peterson. Yeah, the Innocence Project is taking him on, um, which is like a it's just a nonprofit that like they they go they they go in on a lot of people who have been like wrongly accused of murder and stuff like that. Um, it's interesting that they're taking on the case, but like the other thing with with Scott Peterson is that he's one of the like uh, few cases he he had the death penalty originally, but then got they, they got uh, what is it like downgraded to life in prison. But he's the only person I think to ever get the death penalty on exclusively circumstantial evidence with the murder. Like they never found anything specifically tying him to it, which is kind of now he fucking did it. But like he like who else fucking could have done it? But uh, it's one of those where like yeah they never found direct DNA evidence connecting him to the murder, which is kind of crazy when you think about it. Um, but uh, to bring it back to Fargo, I think. Uh, this is something that Fargo season one uh, gets wrong about um, the the sort of karma the characters get in the end uh, because uh, fucking what's his name Martin Freeman dies at the end of season one mm-hmm. right um, he falls through the ice or whatever even though he's like he, like they, don't they chase him up to like like Canada like he's on like a jet ski at the end and then he sinks through the ice. If I remember correctly. Yeah, something like that. It's um, it's been so long, and honestly, who who cares? I'm, I'm pretty and sure that's fun how. Fun fact: we... that first season turns ten years old this year. So if you want to age terribly, oh my god. Um, yeah. yeah, it is ten years old this year. Um, but yeah, uh, I, I remember if I remember correctly, that's what happens, and I think that's wrong. I think that like a character like that, if you want justice, he doesn't die. He uh, he, you know. He 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 because the, the one thing by the end of that show he's just like Jerry, where he's trying to he just wants to avoid the humiliation of being caught for the crime right like mm-hmm. it, it's nothing it has nothing to do with uh um just wanting to get away with it at that point uh, now what do you think of Fargo the TV show I I think for a while I tried to like it more than I did and and now I've just settled on yeah thinking that I don't think it's very good. Um, and some of that is, is just the material and like the mm-hmm. story content and the Ready? filmmaking, but I, another big part of it has to be addressed where that, I think Noah Hawley is kind of a hack. Um, I think, I think he is like what he's doing with the alien TV show. Um, he did also like scab, um, at like to get that made during the strikes. So, oh, okay. Well, fuck yeah, him. Yeah. Fuck him. Yeah. Well, fuck um, him. Um, so, like, that does kind of hang a cloud over, like, this discussion. I, I kind of can't ignore that. Who wants an alien TV show? Like, no offense. Like, I, like Diego, you're the alien defender, right? Like. Yeah. Like, do, you, do you want an alien TV show? No. Like, like, I mean, like, I understand you maybe want another movie, but not a fucking TV show, man. No. Like, it's so dumb. I don't. Ugh. What the fuck? Is that the only alien thing? Is that the... What is it? They just announced a title for it, right? Like, No, no. This, also, this is the alien oh, TV a, show, and then the and movie is Alien Romulus. Good lord. Of all the lessons to take... Of all the lessons to take from Prometheus... I know. To call it Romulus. Uh, now, how much of that is that it's gen- there's a genuinely interesting reason to call it Romulus, or they went through like every Greek and Roman historical and mythological name possible until they found one that sounded good and then wrote backwards from that. I don't know, because um, you know the story of how this one got greenlit, right? No, because I don't pay attention to these things. Okay, uh, Fede Alvarez, I guess, was like talking up something with Ridley Scott. I think he was producing something else. And he liked his idea so much, he's like, we're going to fucking make this movie. And they just like immediately just got fast-tracked a couple years ago. <laughs> mm-hmm. So Ridley Scott likes it. He does not okay. like the idea of the TV show, and I think it's been very clear that he does not want it to be a TV show. To which Noah Hawley retorted, "Well, you know, we're really going to stick to the first two movies. You know, we're gonna we're, we're not going to like address that the Prometheus origin stuff in this wow, show." This, this uh, Noah Hawley's got like he's got such a vision 
he wants to just stick to the first two movies. He, I know. He isn't that, a, like, even as a hater of the franchise now, like, it, isn't that just the most boring shit? Yeah, it's like, it is one of those things where, like, I, you know, I'm just, my whole thing is just, like, I really don't know where you, like, it's it just feels so, like, it's such a difficult franchise because you have to, hit, if everyone feels obligated to hit so many beats, including Ridley Scott, that, like, it just becomes repetitive to me. And uh, it's, but it's also, like, what do you what do you think you're fixing by going back to the first two? You know, like mm-hmm. other than brand recognition, there's no other reason to do it. Like, yeah. Well, it, his it big is one thing was things... also like, well, I loved the the old tech from the old movies, and I thought the prequels advanced the technology too far ahead. So we're going back to that, and it's like, yeah, well, just that's just the normal passage of time. It's not real. It's just what yeah. was capable at the time. And now we're capable of other stuff. Like, what a fucking hack. I'm sorry. Fuck this guy. Fuck yeah. Fargo, uh, the it, show. Fuck Legion. Well, I know a lot of people like that show. Sorry. It's kind of boring. It. It's uh, boring. Well, let me see what my takes are on Fargo. Because like, here's the thing. I watched the first two seasons, and I thought they were okay, but I wasn't, like, head over heels in love with them like other people, right? Like, some people were like... This is as good as Breaking Bad, right? Like they were kind of like, this is a new an insane thing this, to say. This is a, a new high point for television. And I'm like, well, they're they're fine, and they have like good stuff in it, right? Like, yeah. But yeah. the other weird thing is that a lot of the good stuff in it is just Coen Brothers shit, right? Like, mm-hmm. well, the, uh, the, the I will say the actors are very good in all of his shows. Yeah, yeah. Well, the actors are good, but I'm saying that the, the a lot of the character archetypes, like with, specifically with like Martin Freeman, is just straight up Jerry Lundergaard, right? Like he's just straight mm-hmm. up Jerry. But then Billy Bob Thornton character is just like a slightly more Midwestern version of technically not a Coen Brothers character, but of Anton Chigurh, right? Like it was oh, it's yeah, basically yeah. fan fiction of like what if Anton Chigurh went to Fargo, you know? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Like that's that's kind of what it is. And um Allison Tolman, she's great in it. Like the actors are really good. Um and then I remember season two had that weird thing where like there's the UFO that shows up, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, and uh, I remember being like, wow, that's an interesting choice. They took some chances there. And then I totally forgot that that's from the man who wasn't there. <laughs> There's a flying saucer in that movie, too. So they, that wasn't even original, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and I'm trying to think. Like, I think I don't think I watched past season three, although people keep telling me it's good, right? Like, I watched people season three because, do. because of Mary, Mary Elizabeth Winstead was in it then. Oh, yeah, that's great. the so, third season, yeah. Yeah, so, but that's, I think, where I tapped out. But then, what, whatever, uh, Chris Rock was just in the fourth one, and people seem to like Chris Rock in it. And I'm always kind of rooting for Chris Rock to do good dramatic work, apart from, you know, yeah, the other shit that goes on with Chris Rock. <laughs> but, yeah, like, yeah, he, just, just stick, to, stick, stick to dramatic acting. He's good at it. Yeah, uh, well, it's weird, because he's like, I, I want him to be good, but he's also, like, he's in that uh, spiral from the Book of Saw, and he's, like, really bad in that. But I can't tell if it's just because that movie is so poorly written. But, uh, you know, um, yeah, lot, it lot might be a, a mix of both. Yeah, for them. it could be. It could be both things. And then season five, which I think either just happened or is happening. Yeah, it just ended in January. But I didn't hear much about it. I don't even know. Yeah, I heard it was it. it was solid, which means I won't like it. Well, that's, that's the thing is that everyone's like, yeah, it's good. And then you watch it. And it, I, I'll say it is like good, but it's not like. It's not great, right? And there's like so yeah. many, so much other stuff to watch. And TV shows are such a commitment. I don't want to waste my time on like a okay TV show. Um, mm-hmm. Fargo felt really fresh just because it was like kind of the beginnings of like the long form storytelling, like stuff we were doing, we're seeing more regularly, right? In like the post Breaking Bad world. And I think now it's just kind of like, oh, well, that didn't really pan out the way we hoped it would. Um, but whatever. Um, but yeah, it is so it is so weird to me just how much the show is just a riff on uh Coen Brothers shit. You know, like they, they take so many little details from their fucking movies. Oh, well, I think um, that's kinda Noah Hawley's thing. He's like he's he's a he's a, what is he? He's, I think you might have used you might have used the word a little earlier that is perfectly accurate. A hack? Yes. Well, okay, yes, but I think people are really energized by the way he does remix stuff that you already, like, know very well. So I think people are really excited by Legion, which has, like, a very, like, retro 1960s aesthetic to it. 
Mm-hmm. Um, people are like, oh, this is so different and exciting. And it's like, yeah, I mean, on, on an aesthetic level, it kind of is, you know, and that is invigorating for a time. What What, what is Legion? It's about the, that X-Men character. Uh, oh, Charles oh. Xavier's kid. Oh, okay. You know what? That's like, that. that is some of the like, X-Men stuff I just don't pay attention to. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Um... And it, it is it's like its own like pocket thing. You don't you don't need to watch the fucking yeah, movies yeah. and shit. But um yeah. Uh three that, seasons. That, I was told it got great. Um I was also how, told it started great. <laughs> how much did you watch? I saw all of it because I was like, let me let me at oh. least be a knowledgeable hater. So I ended up watching all of it. So you've seen the whole show or just the whole first season? The whole show. Oh wow. Alright, so it didn't get good, is what you're saying. No. Um, I right. do really like how they commit to the powers, like because it's a lot of like mind shit, right? So it's like, I mean, it's honestly kind of on the same level as Sherlock, where I'm like, this is super fluously entertaining. Um, it's like, okay, there's a lot of like mind battles, psychic stuff. So it's like, how can we express that? And it's like, yeah, that's exciting. That's an exciting way to express that. But at the end of the day, there's a lot of people standing around and talking and monologuing at each other, and I'm like, I guess that's a lot of adjectives. I guess that's good writing. It has to be, realize. otherwise everyone's wrong. Yeah, they talk about things that are important, that are like philosophical dilemmas. That must mean it's important. Yeah. Um, Dan Stevens re- is terrific, though. That is I didn't just realize a- he directed Lucy in the Sky. Remember that movie from a few years ago? I do. And you know what? Not to defend him, because he didn't need defending, because he's a scab... Um, but that he did get fucked on that movie. I heard that movie was like really difficult. Who fucked him? I don't know. Producers. All right. Is that like the second Natalie Portman attached thing that had like a weird behind the scenes thing happen to it at this point? Oh yeah, yeah. Because then it was Lucy got a gun, right? Or no, yeah, Jane, no not Lucy got Jane, a gun. Jane got a gun. Yeah, Jane got her gun or something. All right. That was the Natalie thing. Portman, love you. Um, next time there is a movie that you want to star in, with. A, a, a lady's name in the title and then a description of what she does don't do it you <laughs> I have, have a bad I, track record of yeah. that <laughs> well see she she was a producer on jane got a gun but she wasn't a producer on lucy in the sky so okay okay so oh yeah i wasn't blaming her i'm just saying like hey that's a weird track record don't it is it don't is fall weird. into that <laughs> The whole Jane got a gun thing is such a weird story like i've never been able to make heads or tails of what the fuck really happened there so yeah me neither i i genuinely don't i don't know what happened there but um well, it doesn't sound all, like it was fun for anyone it sounds like it all worked out because that movie is now hailed as a classic it no <laughs> <laughs> i thought even people remember what that fucking movie is no it was a hot spec script on the blacklist i think has the blacklist like no offense to the blacklist like i feel like people maybe give it too much shit at this point but like the amount of movies that come from the blacklist that like are fucking nothing is is interesting, right? I think that's that's a, a systemic issue larger than the blacklist. Yeah, I'm gonna, yeah, I'm gonna say it's not. It's I think we don't know how to foster these scripts very well, and then yeah, uh, um, I also think there's that uh, issue. A very good about, one. Oh, here, go ahead. Oh, it's because I think there's an issue of just like sometimes a movie reads very well and doesn't actually, you know work when you film it and sometimes it's hard to judge exactly what which one is which but hey yeah like i'll be honest um paul thomas anderson's scripts if you try to read them i don't think they're that engaging to read Mm -hmm. i think he's one of the best living filmmakers so it doesn't matter you know what i mean they Um, they also talk about that good like I was just saying they talk about that with Tarantino too, where like his scripts are kind of like some people like say like I read the script and have no idea what the fuck it was about. Like, <laughs> so yeah. who knows? Yeah, if you're if you're a, a writer director and you're like gonna direct the only only stuff you write, as long as you know it and understand it and know how to get it, like that's all that matters really. Mm-hmm. Um, but uh, if you want a good movie that came from a blacklist script, uh, they cloned Tyrone from last year, super yeah. underrated. Um. It's a Netflix movie, that's why no one's seen it, but it's very good. And I would yeah, Netflix, recommend it. Netflix may, have, may as well be the kiss of death for relevancy at this point. Yeah. Like, but, um, hey. That's that. At least the, um, the Coen brothers don't need the blacklist. Yeah, yeah. 
Uh, very excited to see what they do next together. I'm gonna go yeah. watch Raising Arizona again because that well, movie they, makes me happy. They keep hinting that the, the the rumors are they're gonna do a horror movie, but they've done they've 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 been attached to things. They've hinted at movies that have never developed in the past before, right? Like. Uh, yeah, yeah, that's true. They have a, they have a few um, under the projects. Whatever, whatever spooky thing they got going on or intense mm-hmm. thing they got going on comes to fruition. Until then, Matt Gringo, thank you for joining me. Where yes. can people find you online? I'm at EmperorOTN1 at Twitter.com, and there might be uh, other things in the future, but we'll see. Yeah, what the fuck happens. Uh, links down to everything else below, including my, my socials. Uh, thanks, everyone, for listening. Uh, like and subscribe if you didn't like this episode. Like and subscribe anyways because you might find something you do like. We'll be back next week to talk about, you guessed it, Citizen Kane. Hey, I forgot we agreed to that one. Yeah. Or, did you say something about picking movies that uh, didn't weren't like universally praised? <laughs> yep, my bad. Oh, well. I'm sure <laughs> That's we'll find, all I got. I, I'm sure we'll find something to talk about that has nothing to do with Citizen Kane. Yeah, yeah, there's stuff to talk about. Citizen Hopefully Kane. there's no more internet drama that I'd bring up for no good reason. <laughs> no, it's, it was tangentially related to Babylon, and we just closed the book on it before talking today about yes. Fargo. So. Yes. All right, goodbye, everyone. Goodbye, goodbye. Jonathan Demi. Goodbye, Judy Foster. <laughs> <laughs> I've been professionally unprofessional. Bye. Bye.